We are here in the Beethoven Hotel in Frankfurt, beautifully catered, and it's the day after the Hertie Foundation gave away the Eric Kandel Young Neuroscientist Prize to this man, Professor Yasser Rudi from Trondheim. Congratulations, Mr. Rudi. Thank you very much. Whenever I talk to Persians, we end up telling each other Mullah Nasreddin stories. <laughs> <laughs> so my belief is that every Persian is a philosopher by heart. Isn't that true? I think there is a degree of um, philosophy in the, in the culture that is true. It exists. It, it very well reflected in the language. The language, I think, over centuries has developed this philosophical way of addressing. There was a quote somewhere I read that uh, when you want to impress an Iranian population, you don't have to say something that makes much sense. It has to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> so Isn't this the reason why you start your website with a poem? Yeah, I think that is, that is one reason. And uh, I really admire Khayyam as a, as a very prominent philosopher, thinker and intellectual and mathematician. He had a very broad understanding of various subjects and very much ahead of his time in many disciplines. But also he had a very deep philosophical way of thinking about sciences and humanity, which I think is very well reflected in the poem. That Please I tell have. it to us. Well, the poem, I, don't, I can't say it in English, but I can tell you what it means, which is those who are intellectuals and educated, they all of us that, that have contributed to the society in that way, it's like telling stories to a society and uh, uh, promoting things. But in the end, there is no absolute truth, maybe, in, uh, in some sense, that all these are our experiences of a world that we will understand through our senses and through our group behavior and interaction with each other. And in that way, we collectively understand a nature that uh, surrounds us. But in the end, we will again go back to sleep and, uh, and the, the, the rest of the universe stays there. Okay. This fits, in a way, with your work. You're looking for a hidden layer, don't you? So the, the work that, is, that I do, um, or I've been doing in the past uh, years, there are two aspects to it. it. It's mainly trying to infer structure in data. So infer structure in data means several different things. So one is that, um, for instance, you are seeing an image. The image comes to your retina. From then on, one very remarkable thing is that it's all darkness. There is no, there is no color in your brain. There is no, uh, it's just neurons active. And through those interactions of the neurons, what you actually discover is some hidden causes in the scenes that you see that led to the retinal activity that you experienced. And so through these layers of processing, you essentially understand or infer the, the hidden causes. I mean, they are hidden because you don't have directly access to them. You just see them through what photons have transferred to your retina. And you know, one, one, one very important aspect of, of, uh, of human brain is this capability of inference at various levels. So through cortical hierarchies, you do that. The other thing is that you can apply, once you have a good understanding of this hidden inference, um, you can apply them to a lot of data sets. So for instance, you, know, you can look at um, neuronal data or, or financial data or genetic data. And you can try to infer what was the um, interactions in that network that led to the particular pattern of activity that you see. So I have worked on financial data and neural data where, where, where you can try to understand the network architecture um, in, uh, in, in the systems by looking indirectly only through the, through the, through the activity. Like in the, in the case of financial data, it is the, the, the stock returns that you see, you don't see really who is talking to who, or what you want mm -hmm. to infer that. There's another layer to this, which is there are many things that you don't uh, measure, you cannot even potentially measure. So if you look at the neural data or genetic da data or financial data, even in the best data sets or the best measurements, you only see a tiny fraction of the big network. And uh, uh, one question which I've been very interested in and I've been working with my students is how can you um, infer something about 
the things that you cannot see. I mean, the, the nodes or the, the, the uh, kind of shadow part, mm -hmm. the dark side of the network, which you have no access of seeing through this indirect activity of other nodes. And you know, surprisingly, there are ways that you can, you can do that and uh, we use particularly statistical physics for addressing some of these problems. They can be easily mapped to problems in, in, in statistical physics. So if you don't see this, this dark side, how can you verify that? I mean, there, there is two aspects to this problem. One is that um, there's a theoretical part which is not difficult to verify in the sense that um, it's like every other mathematical structure. It, uh, it's verification. It's through the logical process where, where, wh what the logical steps that you take to get mm -hmm. there. And as long as those logical steps are valid, then the conclusion is valid. The other thing is the verification of the applicability of those methods to some you know, real life data. Um, so I would say that there is some sort of, say, hypothetical case that we can solve. And those we can easily verify through the you know, logical sequences of thinking and also check it with computer simulations. For instance, you can make a method, you can generate data where you know that uh, everything about it in a computer, then you only look at a part of it, and with that data you try to infer something about the rest. But in this case, you know the grand truth because you generated the data. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you can check your your, your approximations, your, your, okay. your method. But this is not, of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a necessary step, but it's not sufficient to, uh, to make things applicable to, to another system where, which, which is probably much more complex. And in those cases, the best uh, um, way of verification is making predictions. Um, for instance, you know, you can, you can predict a certain part of the network or a certain feature of the network should be present or should um, have an effect on certain activity, parts of the activity that you are seeing. And then from then on, um, it would be an experimental um, question to, to, to test that type of, uh, that type of um, predictions. And uh, I am particularly lucky to be in an experimental environment where experimentalists are willing to test those, those theories in biology, particularly. So in the end, it, is, it lies in the hands of bi experimentalists to test whether the predictions you make about something that you don't see, of course, is, is, is valid or not. Or if it fails, how it fails, which then will feed back to the, to the theoreticians on trying to uh, fine tune or or, or um, uh, develop the methods further to, to, in order to answer those uh, shortcomings. Looking on your personal maps, territorial and cognitive, you were born in Tehran, you're a professor in Trondheim, you studied physics and you do neuroscience. Do you sometimes sit and wonder on your biography? On yeah, your personal way. <laughs> yeah, actually a lot. But I think um, the, this dichotomy between, as I said yesterday, I think this dichotomy between neuroscience and physics, at least for me, doesn't really exist. It's, it's something that is, because for me it is, uh, what I am interested in is, is information processing in general and what that, that, that means. And uh, the nervous system is, of course, a very complicated and the most advanced, in some senses, um, data processing machine that, that, that we have. What I am interested in is neither physics nor biology, in some sense, and it's both. Um, so in that sense, I don't see a, really a dichotomy. And I, and I have a position in a physics institute in, in Italy, one in, in, in Stockholm. So I keep my contact with, with the with the, the communities. I think biological problems, they, they pose a cer certain degree of um, challenge to scientists, to theoretical scientists, that, that, that I think it is unprecedented in, in the other disciplines of, of mathematical sciences or physical sciences, uh, in the sense that we don't really have even a language to describe these processes. Like in, you know, usually the way things work worked in the past in, in physical sciences was that we uh, developed sort of mathematical techniques which were adapted to the particular problem over years 
or generated for answering those problems. So differential geometry was very well adapted for, for, for general relativity or you know, matrix calculations for quantum mechanics. Um, in biology, we are not even close to that. Biology is more complicated than quantum physics? So complicated, I wouldn't say. I think complicated is escape. It's just saying that we don't know. Mm -hmm. I hear this word a lot, and sometimes I use it myself, but the word complex essentially means we don't know. And I think you can easily say that quantum mechanics is much more complicated than, than biology. I mean, it's a system that, that you can't even see. You can't even, if you go to a talk in quantum mechanics, I mean, not quantum mechanics, because no quantum, there is no field like quantum mechanics, but say, um, uh, many body um, condensed matter physics, you see measurements and, and experiments done at temperatures and, and pressures and you know, conditions that you can't Speed. even imagine. Yeah. I mean, the numbers are 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the 25. These are very complicated problems. Um, the only difference between that and uh, biology is that those problems are solved. So, <laughs> so we know the answer to them to a large extent. I mean, if you think about it, if you look at the, if, if somebody comes from Mars to the Earth, and uh, if you ask that person, well, I want to understand that thing in the sky, which, which now we know is a star, but suppose we didn't, would it be easier to understand that or this piece of uh, tissue or this, this uh, leaf? Well, I think the Martian would say the leaf because you have access to it, you see it all the time. But we actually understand those better. I mean, the, 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 it's, it's not the complexity. It is, it is a more, I think, historical why we have not done one versus the other. And I think one crucial aspect of biology is that, um, is, is that it, is, it is, in a sense, a very modern field. Um, it is new. In, in terms of, in, in the way it is done today. Today, yeah. Before, up to maybe 100 years ago, maybe before Darwin, um, it was a descriptive field. You make lists, you categorize things, and that was it. It was, it is very recently that we are doing biology the way we are doing now. And therefore, I think that it is not only, of course it is complex, but I think everything in nature is complex. A galaxy is also very complex. Uh, the stars are also, I mean, the, the fact that physicists can understand the core of, of the Earth or, or, or stellar systems is also very complex. You can't even measure it. You can't even <laughs> go there. I mean, it's uh, very, very high temperatures. <laughs> but I think for some reason we have thought more about those and we have been thinking about them in a different way than, than biological problems. So and the way we do biology today is a, is a very modern way of doing biology, and it's very, very young. Um, so I, I, I think that you know, we'll, we'll get to the point that it will be not complex as much. I mean, I hope. There's no guarantee that we will be able to understand, as there was no guarantee that we will ever understand, say, something in quantum mechanics. You know, whether it, is, it will be successful or not, we will see, but I don't see why it shouldn't be over a long period of time. I mean, that, that, that kind of hopeful thinking is something that you have to have if you're doing you science. You have to. Yeah. Yep. There is no guarantee, but hopefully. <laughs> I like this optimism. It's great. Yeah, I, I wish you lots of luck with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.